So we have Janice Fraser here, uh, and I'm really excited personally to have her here because she's pioneering a sort of new discipline, lean user design. And I believe actually she's one of the person who coined the word. And if you know a little bit about, about Janice and what, who she is, you'll know she's the founder and CEO of Adaptive Path. Uh, their product design firm, they've been around for about 10 years, heavily involved in their internet. In fact, uh, they also, they're, they're apparently coined a lot of words. <laughs> and they coined Ajax, actually, as well as the word walk, right? Um, and so she's lectured uh, all over, uh, especially at Stanford, at Haas. We're super excited to have her here. I think this is going to be an uh, uh, exploding new discipline in terms of uh, lean, iterative type of design for early stage startups. Uh, I myself am the worst designer. I actually have no design skills, so I'm super excited about listening to Janice talk about this. So let's uh, let's please welcome her here. And, uh, welcome. Um, so we opted not to put me on a microphone tonight. So like, raise your hand in the back if you ever can't hear me. Usually I talk too loud, so hopefully it won't be a problem. Um, so yes, we did uh, coin the terms Ajax and Ajax and blog, and if you buy me beer, I'll tell you those stories later. <laughs> um, so uh, this is your startup. Actually, how many of you have a startup right now? Who are working off on one? That's awesome. Okay, now how many of you are designers of some stripe? UX, UI, the good, good number of uh, developers. Handful. Um, other, <laughs> but not desired development. <laughs> so this is your startup. Isn't it cute? It's like this little fuzzy bunny and you love it. You love it. I actually got to put my timer on after the meeting. And, um, and it's really something that we all love so much. And if you're successful, then it will be, uh, uh, it'll grow and multiply and block, stopwatch, Oh, now I know how long I'm jabbering on. Um, so if you're really successful, it'll grow and it'll multiply and you'll get really rich. And if you're really, really successful, you'll get Facebook. <laughs> ah. But for now, it's just this adorable little bunny that is precious that you want to take care of and you want it, you want it to grow and be happy and be um, absolutely as perfect as it is in your imagination. Um, but then there's this guy. Um, those of you who are new to lean ideas may not recognize this man. This is Eric Ries. He is the coiner of the term lean startup. Um, and this is what he wants to do to your lovely little bunny. If you can't see that in the back, it's actually like from Etsy. It's this crocheted little bunny. And when you dissect it, inside there are Easter eggs. Isn't that adorable? The Easter eggs are symbolic of the goodness that you get when you actually examine it. Because your startup actually is not an adorable little fuzzy bunny, even though it feels um, you're very emotionally tied to it. I know this because I've started several companies. Um, really, it's a lot, the better analogy is more like a garden. And um, if you're lucky, eventually you'll be, this is one of the most innovative gardens ever. This is in Madrid. It's actually a vertical garden. And so instead of thinking of this like awful, oversized, scary rabbit, we can think of a beautiful, beautiful growing space. Um, when you garden, sometimes things die. Sometimes you plant things and it's not quite right and they don't have enough water or light and you have to kind of adjust and, and experiment as you go. Gardening is a lot about experimentation. And I know this because I've killed many, many plants. <laughs> So Eric Reese, um, he was heavily influenced by this guy, Steve and Gary Blank. I'm not going to go into a lot of the lean startup fundamentals. I just want to put a few thoughts out there for those of you who might be new to the concept. And if you take, if you take this idea, which says make products that customers want, oh my god, revolutionary, um, release working software in increments, and reduce the amount of inventory buildup, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, then you get something really special. You get this really fast paced, um, quickly successful kind of startup. And that's what Lean Startup is kind of all about. Um, one thing to note, Lean Startup is really not going away. Some people are saying that it's a fad. And yes, the words have become dogma to some. You know, Pivot has gotten a little bit you know, comical and it's overused. But the truth is that um, business schools around the country are adopting this. Um, Northwestern, I'm going to speak at in a couple months, they are actually, they've actually built Concepts of lean startups into their curriculum. Harvard, Stanford, Haas, all of these schools realize that this there's really something special here. So um, the basic idea 
of Lean Startup is Build, Measure, Learn. It's this cycle. And what I want to talk about is a Build, Measure, Learn cycle with a different kind of rabbit. Um, this company is TaskRabbit. It, come, it was a, a funded originally at Facebook Fund. They've been a client of mine since August um, and have sent people to my workshops and are really trying to um, embrace a lean user experience approach. And with TaskRabbit, um, we had this idea, easiest thing to um, explain is homepage conversion. So lean startup story about homepage conversion. These are not the actual numbers, but proportionally, as I tell this case study, you'll, uh, uh, proportionally they're accurate. Um, we knew that 5%, not the real number, was not the right number for conversions on TaskRabbit. We needed to change that number to improve it. And we tried several different interventions. We tried changes in the headlines, changes in the descriptions. You can go back to the page. Um, you can see right here, it says more detail. This was actually the second version of the homepage after I um, came on board. I was not actually doing the design. I was coaching the company through the process of, of um, analyzing uh, how their site was designed and uh, helping them to envision how they could have a process for making it better that matched a lean startup kind of thinking. So, so we did a bunch of things, and, and 5%, not the real number, was, was where we ended up. So we hired this hotshot young designer. Everybody says they want Jason Patorti. Anybody here know Jason, who Jason Patorti is? Yes, he was the designer at Mint, and I was like, I want to be the Mint of blah, 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 blah. I'm the Mint of time issues, right? And, and really, there's no Jason Patorti magic anywhere. Even Jason Patorti will tell you that he's just a guy who happens to do a really good job at a company with a bunch of other people who are doing a really good job, right? So, um, but we did hire this, this kid who is, who had a beautiful portfolio. His portfolio was gorgeous. You can't really see the detail here, but this is this lovely, very photorealistic, extremely well lit, lit um, cork texture, and the, the detail on the site is really lovely. Um, we asked him to do a redesign of the site. He brought in this homepage comp, um, and we looked at it. It was me, the CEO, and the developer who had taken charge of their split testing program and some of their analytics and usability testing. So he was a developer who had an awareness that design and user experience is important, and he wanted to help understand um, what was working and not working on the site. And so he took on this role of evaluation. Um, so it was the three of us standing around looking at the designer's monitor, and we're like, oh my god, this is gorgeous. We love this. We believe in it totally. We think it's awesome. And I turned to Will, and I said, Will, can we get this into a split test tomorrow? And the designer like blanched. He's this like 23-year-old kid who had already you know, had a huge success working at Dig and like all this stuff. He thought it was the best thing ever. And he was brilliant. Uh, thank you. I need to talk louder. Um, and what happened uh, with him, he, he got really afraid and defensive. And he said, what do you, you, we can't launch this tomorrow. I have to do the rest. You can't do this without launching it over the rest of the site. We've got to carry it through and have you know, a, a consistent brand experience. And, and, and I said, well, that's OK. We're just going to do a limited test for a couple of days. We'll take it down. No matter how good it is, we'll take it down. And um, we'll only put it out there to a portion of the, of the visitors of the site. And it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. And he's like, you know, he's really standing up for himself, which I respect. And he said, I want you to take a month. Give me a month. And I will give you the whole site. I can do the whole site for you in a month. Just give me a month. And I said, I would love, thank you. I would love to give you a month. Woo. Um, I would love to give you a month, but I think we should still do the split test. And, and we did. Um, we, his version did not have these pop-ups, which had the extra information in it. So we did a split test with three pages. We had the, the original page with its 5%, not the real number. His page tested out at 4% conversion, so not as good. But his page with the addition of the pop-up was almost entirely to our, uh, uh, to our metric goal. We wanted to double the conversions. And with the one little change, we were able to prove that we were right to believe in this design. One small change to have this little pop-up with one extra link, right? We got all the way to our goal. So what we learned from that is that it's a good idea 
to test these things. This, is, this was such a dramatic result that we actually did a little bit of tweaking to the rest of the, of the site, changed out the header and the footer, and we relaunched it two days later. And in those 30 days, say the site got 10,000 views per day, and that, that 4.75 increased conversion led to 13,000 conversions at $2 a piece, also not the real number, but proportionally accurate. That works out to $26,000 for the month, and it happens that $26,000 is more than most startups spend on design prior to launch total. So that one month, we were able to actually pay for all the design work that most companies spend their money on in a, before they launch. It's a huge result. What we did is we said, oh my god, this is amazing. Not only do you have a month, but you have two months. And he did a great job, and he carried the design through not only the rest of their site, but through some of their collateral materials, and we really doubled down on it. So the lesson here is not that A-B testing is the way to go. The lesson here is that, that even when you feel strongly about things, that things are good, it pays to do experiments, to do small-scale scoped experiments, learn from them, and then once you have that learning, to really double down on the things that you have learned. So the lean principle at work here is about inventory. So when you make a design decision, the amount of time between making that design decision and learning that that design decision was good or, or bad, that's waste. All of this unvalidated learning, all of this unvalidated design is inventory. And if you find out that it's wrong, then it's waste. And what you want is to have as little waste as possible for as little period of time as possible. So what we want to do is reduce the scale of time between making a decision and learning that it was bad by orders of magnitude. In the agency world, three months. At Intel, it was three years, right? From months to weeks to days to perhaps hours. Companies that are doing continuous deployment can um, test uh, uh, design decisions uh, virtually instantaneously. So what this looks like in terms of a risk profile, so this axis is risk and this axis is time, and this is, you know, say, two or three months, right? Each one of these little jags is a release cycle, right? I'm making a design decision, it's a risky design decision, I pay it down. I make another design decision, I pay it down. I'm constantly watching whether the things that I'm doing have um, the kind of impact that I'm hoping that they have. By contrast, the old way, takes you in the slow arc, you can take less risk. What you can see here is that you're taking less risk for a longer period of time, and the total risk is huge. Because if you get you know, to the end of these three months and you have never checked to see whether the work that you did was good, boom, you fall a big long way. So what I want is to take a lot of the danger out of being a designer. Um, Eric says, build, measure, learn. In the design world, we say, think, make, check. So. Think, make, check, and build, measure, learn are interesting in two ways. I learned this think, make, check thing more than 10 years ago. In 2000, 2000, in 2000, when I did my first project with the uh, Active Path co-founder, Mike Kuniawski, he taught me this. Think, yeah. make, check. That's my bell. I love Mike. Sorry. I love Mike K. Mike's the man. Rock. <laughs> Mike Kay also is the author of a fantastic book called Observing the User Experience. Yeah. We're also getting some representation over here for that book. He's got a new book coming out on ubiquitous computing. All right, Mike Kay. Um, so think, make, check. Um, we want to reduce the cycle time. What's amazing to me is that we have this moment where in the past, designers had to fight to get permission from our clients to talk to users either to get research in, to help inform our design decisions, or to validate um, through usability testing or other kinds of measurements. Right. Now what we have is customer development and lean startup actually demanding that we do these things. Designers start with think, make, check. Think is the first step. Eric Ries starts with build, build, measure, learn. And I think the tension between those two things is very informative, it's very instructive. Designers like to think about things first. We like to build empathy for our customers and then make a product that they want. So we, we call that the thinking part. 
Eric says, jump in and make something first so you don't spend all of your time imagining and forget to build. Both of these techniques are useful, so what matters most is just start somewhere and go through the whole cycle. Think, make, check, think, make, check, think, make, check. So this huge realization that I had last summer, as I was really digging into lean startup thinking, is that basically <coughs> customer development and user experience design, user-centered design, are more or less the same thing. There's a heavy degree of overlap. Eric, uh, 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 Steve Blank goes as far as to say, you know, you should do a persona. His persona has things like, where will you find these people? The only difference is that my persona would have things like, what do these people need? But it's the same research, it's the same kind of interviewing. All we have to do is just shift the lens a little bit. So, bottom line, what I think, keep your inventory low, talk to your customers, make something they want, and prove your ideas and interfaces. What's awesome is that user experience people have been doing these three things for a really long time, and we have a lot of expertise in it. And if we start to play together in the same sandbox, oh my god, how awesome will that be? What I want you to hear, if you hear nothing else tonight, is this. You will have a successful lean practice if you do two things. Prove and prove, prove and prove, prove and prove, prove and prove. It's like the chugging of a choo-choo train. Prove and prove, prove and prove, prove. Like, that's it. If you prove what you know, you're always asking, well, how do I know that? How risky is it? If it's really risky, let's prove it. Prove it. Once you, once you prove it and learn from that, then you can improve it, right? Oh, this is awesome, now we can go farther. There's a story that I heard from the founding creative director of Imbue, which is Eric Reese's startup that kind of started this whole lean startup thing. Um, his name is Marcus Gosling, and Marcus told a story about when they um, first launched pets onto Imbue. Imbue is this virtual world where, you know, like housewives in Kansas make all these crazy garments for their avatars and all this stuff, and it's really successful, makes a lot of money, um, selling virtual goods. Well, and one of the kinds of virtual goods they thought they could sell was pets. Oh my God, how awesome would that be? You could have a pet in your virtual world with your crazy costumes. But they launched the pets feature as a Tamagotchi kind of thing, where you have to take care of your pet. And within a couple months, all the users just had dead pets. <laughs> These like sad little puppies. Like, mm. And they're like, well, that, that's kind of not, not what we wanted. So they took the feature down, and they did some research, and they launched this tiny little feature to a small portion of their users, where you could have a pet, but you could dress the pet up. You could customize the pet. You could make the pet pretty, and so the pet became a fashion accessory, right? They did this very small-scale test and kind of launched it in a rudimentary way. Um, they spent probably a month on it, learned that people loved it, oh my God, loved it, and then they spent another year getting the feature right. They invested heavily in it. So um, this kind of prove, improve, prove, improve, prove, improve. They were able to prove with the first test that people wanted pets, that pets was a good idea because everybody adopted it. Then it failed. And then they improved it. And then it succeeded. Okay, That's the lesson there. Prove, improve, prove, improve. So I don't want to pick on developers here, but I, I put this slide in after I taught a two-day workshop over the last two days. Um, I don't like throwing away my darlings, but this talk is called Kill Your Darlings for a reason. And the reason that it's called Kill Your Darlings is that, you know, the MU guys had to throw away all the pets. They had to bury all those dead dogs. And yesterday when I was teaching this two-day workshop on lean user experience for startup teams, I had this one team who was like, you know, this has been really interesting and it's caused some really serious um, discussions. And they said discussions, you could hear the air quotes around discussions. Really serious discussions between me and my co-founder. The co-founder was sitting, one, one was sitting on my left, one was sitting on my right. And it's clear that they had had this like massive kind of discussion. And um, it, the developer was really upset that they had to throw away code. It's like, you know what? Apple throws away 90% of the stuff that it makes. 90%. So 
So get used to it. Designers, we throw shit away all the time. You know what, professional photographers, the reason that all their photos look great, they throw away all the ones that look ugly. And it's not that, you know, you can write really, really good code, but if it's the wrong thing for your customers, it's okay to let, to let it go. Hopefully learn something through that. So your job as a developer or an entrepreneur or you know anybody on this team is simply to learn from the actions that you do. And if that action is writing a line of code, it's okay to let it go. And if that action is making a comp, it's okay to let that go. If that's the right thing to do, as long as you learn from it. So lean means getting comfortable throwing things away. I actually, I have a suspicion that Apple is a very, very lean company. Their, their attitudes around experimentation, they may not go out of house the way that some of us do, but their attitudes about experimentation and getting it right and learning is pretty, pretty, pretty spectacular. So now I wanna give you just a, an overview. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. This is packed with information. Um, I will try over the next, let's say 12 months, to unpack all of this information and write blog posts about it. But for now, I just want to put some seeds of ideas out there about how we're thinking about lean user experience. The first is cross-functional teams. To have a good lean user experience capability, your developer, your designer, UI person, whoever that happens to be, and your business thinker, all are one product team. One product team. No longer is there what Pivotal calls the one ringable neck, where developers are in one pile and they're working in their scrums and there's a business owner. And that business owner represents everybody else in the world. Those days are gone. If you isolate design over here, you isolate development over there, and you all hate the marketing and sales people, it's not gonna work. You make decisions together about what's best for the product. The second part is that it's principle driven. So it is a process, sure, but more than a process, there's a framework for thinking about this stuff, and there are some ideas behind that framework. And it's the framework that matters, it's the principles that matter. I'm gonna go through what I think those principles are. This is a rough draft. Um, I've presented it probably 15 times now, maybe 20, and I'm constantly looking for feedback, so please do send me feedback. My contact information will be up at the end of the talk. So it's a, a process driven by principles, and the principles are more important than anything. The principles, um, or the process is characterized by rituals. So we take those principles and we embed them into certain organizational behaviors. I'm gonna give you the most actionable thing tonight. It's not in my slide deck, I apologize, but I told it to some people earlier today and realized like, I should put a slide in here about this one thing. It's called a wireframe check. If you're a designer and you're making wireframe, when you have that wireframe to a certain level of readiness, whether it's written on a whiteboard or a pencil sketch or omnigraphal or balsamic or whatever, you go over to your developer and you have a stand-up meeting, just a little brief stand-up meeting, and you ask the same four questions every time. Write these down, this is golden. Question number one, is this an accurate reflection of the system? Yes, sure, no is a fine answer. It'll lead to a good discussion. Question number two, what here is hard? One of the common frictions between design and development is that designers don't always know what's difficult and what's easy. If we ask it ahead of time, we can make better decisions together in a very, very short amount of time. So what here is hard? What alternatives are there? Well, doing that you know, thing with all those values in it, that would be very, very hard because that's not how our data is structured. Well, what else could we do? Well, how would we do it this, year, this way? Together, you're coming up with a solution. So what alternatives are there? The fourth question is, is it worth the effort? Sometimes the answer is yes. But what you don't want to have happen is for your developer, being the good team player that they are, to go off and spend two days coding up something that the designer really didn't think was that hard and really didn't care about that much. Because at the end, the designer's like, oh man, I'm so sorry. And they feel like, oh my god, I'm an idiot. And then the developer's like, oh, you, right? And everybody feels bad, but everybody was trying to do the right thing. So what we wanna do is turn those interactions around. And by being one product team and having these kinds of little ritualized um, actions, like doing a wireframe check, having a stand-up meeting, having the designer in the stand-up meeting, these rituals will help to make the right thing happen inevitably. 
Okay, you want the you want the inevitable thing to be the right thing. And the outcome that we have with this kind of a process is that your team, made up of you know smart people, but kind of regularly smart people, not like genius wizards with bad magic pixie fairy design dust. Regularly smart people will be able to reliably produce high quality, high velocity user experiences for your product. That's what I want. And that's what I think Lean brings to the table. So if we take everything we already know about user experience and everything we already know about Agile and we add in these Lean ideas about cycle time and optimizing cycle time, we're gonna make better products much faster and we'll have happier teams. That's what I think and that's what I want for you. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the principles fairly quickly. This slide deck is available on SlideShare. My SlideShare name is Clever Girl, so you can get it there. Um, so the principles, we've already talked about it's one product team, design, product management, and development. Externalize, designers put shit on walls, and the amazing thing is that if you put shit on walls, four people can stand in a little you know, group right here, we can point, and we can all read it. And we can talk about that thing. So instead of saying, sitting at a conference table and having the I think you think conversation, where we disagree and there's no way to get out of that conundrum, we can point over here and say, well, what is, what is this? Tell me about this. And then the first thing is not about agreement. The first thing is about understanding. And that changes the dynamic of conversation. A lot of this is organizational. Agile people know it's all about how we work together. Third principle. Research with users is the best source of information. I think you think has to, can't hold a candle to, oh, well, this is what those people did. Oh, this is how you know Susie, our persona, spends her day. Right? The more we understand the people that we're making products for, the better our product will be. You want to focus on solving the right problem. One of the ways that you can do that is something that um, Kiss Metrics does. I got this from Heat and Shaw. He, um, oh no, actually it wasn't Kiss Metrics. It is Andrew Chen. Andrew Chen blog. If you don't read it, you should. It's a fantastic blog. Andrew Chen has his team organize all of their um, iterations by user code. So each time they're doing an iteration, when they're doing their iteration planning, they pick a, a quote from a recent user interview, and that becomes the theme. And all of the user stories in their backlog that they decide to put into that um, release are all about that one user quote. So inherently, that, that release is going to meet a user need. So they're focusing on solving the right problem and they're using their user research as the, the guiding light there. Another thing that I think is inherent in Lean, because you're doing these rapid cycles, these think make check cycles very quickly, you can generate many options, go very broad, very quickly. User experience people have some ways of doing this. And then decide what to do quickly and go for it. The reason that you can do this in this environment, in this new way, is that the cost of making a mistake is very low. So you, you generate a lot of ideas, you choose the one you're gonna go with. If you happen to have chosen wrong, you're checking the effectiveness of your work so you'll find out, so it's not gonna be out there and, and, uh, and, and failing without noticing. So you'll know whether it fails, and if it fails, you can go back and do it again with one of those other ideas. So the way to move quickly is to flare and then focus. That's what the Stanford D School calls this, flare then focus. Core principle of all lean stuff is recognize hypotheses and validate them. Recognize when you're making a guess, even if it's an educated guess. It's important to say, oh, well, I think that what people need to hear about is this framework for lean user experience, but perhaps you don't. So I'm gonna ask you to give me feedback, okay? So I'm recognizing my own hypothesis and I'm asking you to help me validate that, right? This is harder than it sounds. Formulating a good, articulating a good hypothesis takes practice, but the more you do it, the better you get at it. The more you do it together with your blended product team, the better you're gonna get at it, right? This is like developing a new kind of muscle. And we've already talked at length about think-made check, so habit cycles. Um, 
the framework is pretty straightforward. All the user experience people in the room are gonna get this inherently. There's a little bit of agile development at the very end, so you start with who people are. Everything above this little dotted line here is about human beings. Who are the people who are gonna be actually hands-on with my software? What do they do every day? What role does this play in their life? What, what do they need? How are they solving their problems already? Then th this little triangle here is my kind of icon representing business strategy. The intersection of your business strategy and their real human needs every day, that's your value proposition. And you can describe that value proposition in terms of uses. Alexa, Alexa Andrzejewski is the founding CEO, founder and CEO of Food Spotting. Doing really well, they're kind of blowing it up. They did great at South by Southwest. They raised their Series A, like they're really doing fantastic. She started that um, business, uh, out, they incubated it out of Adaptive Path. She was a user experience designer. She started it by designing this poster. This poster had nine single frame cartoons and each one represented something that a person would use it for. So one was a sketch of a person taking a picture of a dish at a restaurant. Another one was a picture of a person holding their phone up, standing on a street corner looking for some food. I always use pho. I love pho, right? Vietnamese noodle soup. Where in this neighborhood can you get that, right? So she described what somebody would use this application for. Not in terms of the software, but in terms of the person accomplishing something based on their actual real needs, right? I need to find pho in this neighborhood. So she drew the uses based on their needs and based on her vision for the business. From there, you can unpack it into features. You can do all your user experience, designy, wireframey, pixely, PSD, blah de blah stuff, right? Then you turn it into user stories. You theme your releases by user quote and you know, Fox or Uncle. Come on, aren't you British? Fox or Uncle. All the way through, you're doing these little think, make, checky kind of cycles. Think, make, checky. What differentiates lean user experience from other kinds of user experience is not that you know lean user experience is cheap and other user experience is fat, right? Lean user experience just means that we're reducing waste. The word lean comes from lean manufacturing. Um, in order to move in this lean kind of fashion with these rapid cycles, we're gonna look for user experience methods that are lightweight, low-fi, low-tech, external meaning we put it on the wall, External face-to-face -face and collaborative together, that's a really special triangle there. If it's external and we're in the same room or perhaps via Skype, I've done this with teams that are remote using a lot of Skype collaboration, and we're collaborating in real time, then there's no design department over there, development department over there, business, everybody hates the marketing and business guys. There's none of that. If you're working together, collaborating on something in real space, you're gonna have better conversations and you're gonna get farther faster. That's just the way it is. I do a lot of work with brown paper, eight and a half by 11 white paper, and two sizes of Sharpies. I can tell you more about that later if you want. Generative and decisive is that flare and then focus. Flare and then focus. You go wide, you come up with a lot of ideas, and I mean a lot of ideas in a couple hours maybe, a lot of ideas in 10 minutes, and then you choose the one that you're gonna go forward with. Um, fast, kind of speaks for itself. I don't like dithering. I don't like people spending a lot of time talking unless it's useful. I don't have meetings ever. I have working sessions. We accomplish something in a working session. We're gonna come together and we're gonna work on something. And at the end, we're gonna have something to show for that. Maybe it's a decision, maybe it's a new insight, but we're gonna work. We're not getting together to meet. I meet for coffee outside of my office. In my office, I work and I have a lot of fun. Repeatable and routinized, these two things go together. Repeatable means that it's just how we do things. We do it over and over again. All the new people who come in, they learn how we do things. We have this repeatable way that we do things. We're not reinventing our process all the time. We're not reinventing new methods all the time, unless we need a new method, and then we make one, and then we can repeat that one. Routinized means it's just how we do it. So it is something that is repeatable, and then we do repeat it. Likewise, goal-driven and outcome focus go together. Goal-driven means I know why I'm redesigning the TaskRabbit homepage. I'm redesigning the TaskRabbit homepage because I need to uh, double my conversions. Outcome focused, or uh, yeah, outcome focused means that I actually notice whether or not what I did increased 
conversion rates. So goal-driven is part of it. You have to know why you're doing something. Outcome focus means we actually notice. We go looking to find out whether we accomplished it or not. This, I think, is new for user experience people. We've wanted to work with this way, but we haven't had permission. And now we have permission, and not only permission, we have a mandate. So I really, really don't want you to have to read this. Just know that this says, hey, look, we've got all these ways to do all this stuff that you have to have done in your startup. So come ask us to join the party, because we want to play. The other thing that's really interesting is um, Steve Blank says, get out of the building. Well, you know what? We've been getting out of the building in really structured ways with lots and lots of different books telling us how to do that for a long time. So we know how to ask the questions that are going to get you the kinds of insights that you actually can build a business around. Um, there are a couple of books, um, one by a guy named Hugh Byer, another by a person named Indy Young, that are fantastic at this. Frankly, Mike Kuniowski's book, which was written eight years ago, is also a good resource. So there are lots of books about how to get out of the building in a meaningful way. You shouldn't just go sit down at Starbucks and talk to somebody and say, like, hey, what do you think of my product? Like, you should really actually know why, what you want to get out of that, and how to ask the right question. Yeah? Two books. What was that? What are the two books? Okay. Um, I'm actually going to give you three books. One is Hugh Byer. I think it is called, I always get it wrong, User-Centered Agile Methods. It's a small monograph. Uh, Byer and Holtzblatt are the UX strategy researchers who invented a thing called contextual analysis, which is a heavyweight method. This little monograph that I just cited is his attempt to make it a, a lighter weight method. It's, he's academic, it's not a very interesting book, but it's very educational. It, it will help you do better research. The second one is um, Indy Young. Her book is called Mental Models. This is a thick book, and she has this very involved methodology, but the kind of research that she does will, it, uh, actually, Mint, I mentioned Mint, um, Indy was an, uh, an early uh, uh, consultant to Mint. I think they paid her about $80,000 to do a mental model for them about how people understand money. Right? So the idea that lean startup means cheap startup, no. They paid money for experts to come in and help them think, make, and check. The third book is Mike Kuniowski. It's called Observing the User Experience. Okay. So we have lots of methods for getting out of the building. There are a few rituals. I think that this is really where the rubber meets the road. One of them that I already told you about is the wireframe check. I'm going to give you a couple others. Um, I'm going to outline two things. One, um, the retrospective. I want these combined uh, these blended teams, product teams, to be doing retrospectives on a regular basis. What that does is it inspires a culture where learning together and helping each other succeed is the norm. And I think that that more than anything gets everybody kind of moving in the same direction as peers. The one thing that really is going to change everything is having this blended team be a functional cohesive unit. If the user experience person and the developer and the business people are all thinking about users, customers, and their needs, then inevitably the product is going to get better over time because you're doing that prove and prove, prove and prove, prove and prove. So this culture of learning, I think, is the foundation of all of it. This is a lesson that I took from Agile. I have done a lot of work with a company called Pivotal, which is an ex uh, they, they use an extreme programming model of Agile. And they're one of the most curious organizations I've ever seen. They're constantly learning. They're very, uh, they're very sought after. And it has been incredibly influential in my thinking. So, retrospectives. That's, that's one of the things that they point to as core to their culture. And the final thing, this one, this one goes out to all you UX people out there, house cleaning. Ideally, we would never have to go through and scrub the site and make sure that, you know, so on this page, the button is over here, and on the next page, the button is like, you know, 15 pixels to the left, and, you know, the blue is like this tone here and that tone there, and like, all of that stuff 
makes your site feel just not quite right. And it happens in agile environments. One of the things that's most frustrating for designers is that you feel like you're designing piece parts, not a system. And every once in a while, you have to step back and make the system flow and function as a system. On the developer side, um, one of the things that Pivotal says is make it green, then make it clean. So you make the software work, and then you make the software elegant. And this, this design idea of house cleaning is kind of the same thing. We're building up user experience debt by designing in these piece party ways. And every once in a while, you have to step back and just do a house cleaning. So once you have that good cultural you know, collaboration between design development and business, the designer can occasionally, every couple months, every six months, say, hey, I need a house cleaning release. And we just go through, and we're going to do like, you know, four days, just tidy everything up, and everyone gets on board, and you do it. So that's the end of my talk. You still have like adorable Fuzzy Bunny. I love your startups. I love every one of them. I do, I do, I do. Um, and I would love to see them turn into big, giant, scary, Facebook-sized rabbits. <laughs> mutant bunnies. Big mutant killer bunnies with huge valuations. There you go. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. This is going to be on SlideShare later. There's a version of this on SlideShare now. Are you on SlideShare? Kill your bunnies? Well, you have to go look at my other uploads because those are recent. Or kill your darlings, I think. If it's not there, let me know. Maybe it's the mobile version. No, it's not the mobile version. Other? Yeah? Uh, I just want to say I, I like, I uh, hadn't heard the term user experience debt before. And I actually think that's a really useful concept, especially if you iterate a lot of times at a certain point you do need to clean it up, and I, I don't know how many of you, but techn technical debt, technology debt, is a very common term, yeah. and so I, that resonates. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's part of the reason that I, I thought of it, and it, I found that it resonates with developers. Like, they go, oh, yeah, I get it. Yeah. It also is something that resonates with designers. You know, they haven't really put that, that concept together, and I, the idea that you can recognize it and then fix it is kind of a, a big relief for designers. Or request a build to fix it. Yes, request it, don't fix it, and then have that request yeah. be respected. Yes. Yeah. There was a question in the back somewhere? Yeah, in these, uh, these integrated teams, do you have like a, a product manager driving things or a product owner? I'm just curious. Um, I, I no longer want there ever to be a product owner. We own the product. Um, the, the thing about a product owner as a role, which is very common and Agile, Agile kind of asks for that, is that that becomes the one ringable neck. Right? So you better get it right, you product owner, or the product's going to fail and it's not my fault because I'm just writing the code. Like, I think that there needs to be shared responsibility. And so you know, ultimately somebody has the role of prioritizing the backlog and choosing what's going to get built. Um, and there are various ways that I'm seeing come out that, that work. Uh, Heat and Shot, his metrics divides his team into two groups. One is the problem group and the other is the solution group. The problem group is responsible for organizing that backlog, deciding which problems are the most important to solve. And then the solution group is responsible for solving the problem. Now, as a UX person, I can't imagine not doing the research to decide which things are most important, but it is working really well for them, and they have a fantastic um, UX capability, so. <coughs> is that a sufficient answer? I have a follow-up to, to that about, um, I mean, is there a back and forth between the two teams, or is it problems get decided, solutions get decided that there is no cycle. Well, I, so the question is, is there a back and forth between the problem team and the solution team? And certainly there is. Um, but the way that they've got it implemented is very thoughtful. And it's not a huge company. It's not like a company of 100 people. You know, not that that's really huge. Um, it's, I don't even know how big they are, 20 something at this point, Kissmetrics? Patrick's nodding. Um, it, so, you know, Cindy Alvarez is the product manager. She she comes out of a user experience background, and I'm sure that they have a lot of conversations. So, you know, it's not. But the thing is, it's not that halfway through they're going to decide that some other problem is more important. I'm sure that happens occasionally, but it's probably the exception rather than the rule. So, 
Also, the, with regards to problem the team solution, Eric Reese talked about that a long time ago. So if you Google that, because Eric Reese are sort of less important. Great. A lot of verbiage about that. Thanks, Ken. Whoever I have asked for I'm, I'm looking forward to Eric's book so that I can kind of read in a cohesive fashion what his thoughts are on these things. Yeah. Quick question. So we talked a lot about measuring and learning. Um, kind of the traditional uh, user experience, usually test this environment that it's perhaps a little bit uh, different than the ideal environment for testing the behavior and you know, the new user experience. Can you talk a little bit about what, how testing changes? So um, the question is about the difference between traditional usability testing and kind of how validation gets done um, in a lead startup. And uh, I think it's a great question. I actually think usability testing can, can be done in its traditional way you know, now. I wrote a story for New Architect magazine in 2001, which used to be like Web Builder. I don't know what it was called. Um, and I advocated doing usability testing every week. Just bring in three people every week and test your product, or test your competitor's product, or ask them questions, or something, but just having this like breathing. I compare usability testing to the liver. Like you would die without it, but it can't drive, you know, it's not gonna move the blood through your, through your brain. Um, so there are a lot of tools, what's different now, and I think this applies to lean startups and to big companies as well. There are a ton of tools now, like usertesting.com and Five Minute Tests and all of these tools. I think all of, give, all of those give you some new options, but there's nothing to replace sitting down with a person face to face and watching them use your product and struggle through it. So, so I think qualitative is really important. I think quantitative is also important. So quantitative includes, you know, there are two main types of quantitative that happen right now. One is the split test. Uh, the other is this kind of analytics, um, following people through the site. You can watch what they do. You can watch um, conversion rates, dropout over paths, that sort of thing. So there's this analytics kind of quantitative that you can do, and and there's the um, split test. So quantitative and qualitative, all of this goes into into validation, right? So that's the check in my think make check or the that's the measure in the build measure learn. Um, there's another kind of research that I didn't call out in this explicitly, and that's generative research. So this is the kind of research that you would do to understand and empathize with the customer that you're trying to solve, the individual human beings that you're trying to support with your product. And I don't care whether you're a B2B product or a B2C product or a B2B2C product, everybody at the end of the day is an individual human being using software, and you need to understand that person. If you're a a B2B with an indirect sale, you need to also understand the person who's gonna be making the purchase decision, but that's not how you craft your product. You craft your product to meet the needs of the actual humans who have a problem to solve. And so you do, with that kind of research, you're not measuring anything. Measuring will contribute to your imagination, but it's not the best way to um, imagine great things. The best way to imagine great things is to develop a deep sense of empathy for the people that you're serving. This is something the Stanford D School talks a lot about. With that kind of interviewing, you're talking about getting the other person to tell a story. So this is what the Indie Young book is really good at. Getting people to tell you a story and then deriving data and learning from those stories, looking at patterns and behaviors. What's wonderful about that research is that it's evergreen. You do that research you know, once a year, twice a year. Right? as opposed to usability testing or these quantitative checking kinds of things. You do those often. With the, use of, with the testing validation, where you're looking for like five to 10 bullet points of things we're gonna fix right now. With this generative research, you're looking for really big understanding of people. Two very different techniques for doing research um, and uh, two very different kinds of deliverables and outcome at the other end. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do we use Google Website Optimizer? Um, I, as many of my customers, clients do. Okay. Sure. And uh, two was my company does that we split test different like key landing pages or key uh, key pages in a website sales funnel. Mm -hmm. You know, after mapping out that sales. Yep. And uh, we you know we just do multivariate tests. Would that be considered user experience design by going through the sales funnel like that or not? Sure, sure. You can apply user experience thinking to sales funnels. You can apply user experience 
thinking to any component of your product before the actual transaction happens or after. Um, anytime that you're trying to, anytime that you can identify a problem and attempt to solve it, um, that's a design challenge. That's kind of the, the, the base definition of design that you'll learn in grad school, right? Um, and uh, the difference between a professional designer and an amateur designer is in the breadth of techniques and tools that they have, and um, hopefully in the quality of hypotheses that they're putting forward, right? So the brilliant design kid who wanted the monk to do his work, like he came up with a gorgeous solution and we all instantly knew it was right. It just needed to be tweaked a little bit. And none of us could have come up with that solution because we're not that kind of designers. Right? So in the case study that you mentioned, what was the pop-up about and why did it do so well? Uh, what was the pop-up about and why did it do so well? So we were using a you know traditional kind of it's one, two, three kind of model for the landing page. And what we needed was more information about one and two and three. We didn't, it's a very complicated sell. That particular company um, is offering a kind of service that people aren't used to getting. It's not just replacing something that they are very familiar with. So we needed to be able to explain it. You know, post tasks. Well, what kind of tasks do people post? Well, you can have someone bring you your cell phone when you leave it at home. Like it, it's not not something that you would instantly be able to understand. So we needed more information, but we didn't want to let them off the homepage. We didn't want the homepage to call it leaky. We didn't want the funnel to be leaky. So we need to provide that contextual information for it. Which in the design world, we would call that content strategy. So, yeah. Follow on to that, did you try other formats like adding your videos, explain that? Do we try other formats? Yes, we have tried a number of other formats. Um, we had, they had a video, they had a, their video was three minutes long, so it was way too long, which, you know, I was like, yeah, you can't put a three minute video and ask people to convert from that, so no. Um, and the CEO at the time did not have the time, frankly, to redo the video, um, so we opted to do it in text instead of video. They're having the video redone probably in a month or two, so, yeah. Um, first of all, I love you, Doc. Thank you. Like, you you've taken <laughs> like so a much. lot of things that intuitively have always felt right and really like laid them out in a framework that makes sense. So thank you for that. Good. Um, so in addition to doing product work, you mentioned a lot about product work and how you know as designers and UX people, we now have permission to work this way. Um, I my agency does a lot of digital marketing work for clients, um, right. and specifically we do a lot of theatrical marketing, which are films that are here today and gone tomorrow. And we definitely have not gotten permission to uh, work this way yet. So what I was uh, wondering is, have you had any experience working with um, kind of marketing agencies or advertising agencies that have taken either this entire methodology or parts of this methodology and implemented it with success? Um, I have not, because I, I am 100% product. I, I am the dorkiest marketer ever, which you will see if you ever read any of my marketing copy, which hopefully you won't ever have to. Um, so. <laughs> I try really hard not to try and give those people advice because it would be bad. Um, however, I think that this kind of thinking is perfect for here, now, gone, tomorrow kinds of situations. I mean, so I'm thinking in terms of, uh, here's, here's an analogy. I'm, so first of all, you should know I'm old. I'm older than the internet. And my first job, I spent five years as a magazine editor with a very large, very successful publishing company. And um, they had people in the circulation department who wrote cover cut lines, right? And a magazine is here for a month gone, right? And so what they needed to do was test which covers were gonna be best. And instead of doing it with the idea that I'm gonna test my cover cut lines and then I'm gonna re-release the magazine because you can't do that, right? Because it's physical and it's on a truck and it gets delivered to newsstands, right? Because this is before the internet. Um, <laughs> which is really embarrassing. Um, uh, they would they would learn by test by they would do a lot of split testing not just a b a b c d e f g h i right in the south these five covers are being tested and in the northeast these four te covers are being tested and they would learn every month they would learn something so they would do those tests not so that they could then manufacture new covers they did those tests so that the, the next month they could write better cover cut lines right and the cut line is the little words on the on the I almost said the home page. <laughs> on the front of the magazine that caused people to per make the impulse purchase. 
sex, it turns out sex does sell. Yeah, so, you know. Also, puppies. <laughs> bunnies. Little white fuzzy bunnies. That was a big hit at South by Southwest, let me tell you. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. I love 37 signals. But they, they, but they should focus on more developers doing a lot of marketing, developers doing a lot of like the whole stack. Right. Well, that works, that works for 37 signals because 37 signals is doing what I call PLM. They're designing for people like me. So Jason Freed makes products that Jason Freed wants, right? And so they can market to Jason Freed. So that they're, when you're marketing to a developer, it's totally fine to have a developer write your marketing copy. So I, I think um, it is not a, I think that their point of view is not broadly applicable to other businesses. So. But they're also serious a lot of the UI design. My point stands. Yeah, they're doing a lot of the design. They're, and they are talented designers. I mean, 37 Signals was a design firm, first and foremost. You used to be able to pay Jason Fried $10,000 to have him evaluate your homepage. Yes, Patrick. Mistakes they make. Yeah, giant yeah. pitfalls that people fall into. The first mistake, um, I, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try and talk about three, but I might forget. So, first one, the first mistake is not being open to being wrong, right? So, the, the teams that do poorly, or, you know, relatively speaking, less well in the, the um, in our work together are the ones that think that they already know how to do it and are like, well, I already know all this stuff. Well, I already know all this stuff. And then it turns out that they're only hiring people exactly like them and they can't work with people who aren't like them, like that kind of thing. So that's the first mistake. So uh, humility is the key to lean, to making lean work. Like, honestly, I don't know if this shit is right. I think it is. I'm seeing patterns and that's great, but I'm hoping that you all will help me get better. Which leads to the second mistake, which is that it's incredibly painful to get negative feedback. I mean, incredibly painful. It is personally threatening to every single one of us to get negative feedback, right? And, um, you know, I got negative feedback yesterday, this morning about the talk that I did yesterday, the, the work I did yesterday. And that hurt me, and I was like, my business partner happens to be my husband, and I'm like, so what did you think about his feedback? And Jason's like, Jason's my husband, he's like, you know what, I think it's fine. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> Oh, the mistake is not is not taking it, is putting that, letting that barrier be there, right? So, and I have to talk myself through it, and I think probably all of us do if we're honest, right? The easiest thing to do is reject it as, well, that's not the business I want to be in. Well, that's not the business I want to be in. And, you know, what I have to do is just, like, let it be okay that, like, it, I don't like it, and then learn from it. So that the next time I do the two-day talk or the two-day workshop, I'm going to be better. So, okay, so how do I handle that situation with that, because I'm going to get that kind of company again, and I want those companies to refer their friends. Yeah. Did you? I, I was going to say, um, I got on my way to take engineers and designers and put them in usability tests, and, yeah. I, and I tell them, this is going to make you feel bad, but shut your mouth. Like, yeah. take notes, listen, don't respond, and don't react. And I think a lot of this is really cultural to the company. Like, if yeah. your culture is not ready for this, you need to change your culture and then do it. You can't do it and then change your culture because it will fail. I really appreciate hearing that. The comment was that it's really cultural and that it, it helps a lot to have developers observe usability tests and that kind of thing. Um, people are often disappointed when they come, not often, some people, and this is some of the feedback I got yesterday, it was so painful. Some people are disappointed that I'm not telling them how to make wireframes better. And I, I don't think that that will be helpful. What I think is most helpful is to talk about these underlying issues um, because that's really what will make change happen. If we want to have a reliably good user experience capability, we need to have a design-ready organization. And, um, and that's, what, that's what my kind of soapbox is all about. So thank you very much for that, for that validation because it hurts so bad. It does, yeah. <laughs> Let's do three more questions, guys. Awesome. Let's do three more questions, and then we'll break for the Apple TV and all that stuff. So we'll make three big questions. Okay, one, two, three. Well, and that kind of reminds me of 
you're seeing a lot of user testing where all the people on the team say, oh, they're just stupid. Do you still see that, or are people starting to get that? Oh, yeah. It's cultural. You see it. People are yeah. like, well, that person's stupid. They should do that. I mean, of course it happens. At, like, they're... 90% of the entrepreneurs that I see are under the age of 25. Like, they haven't seen good usability testing for the last 10 years. You know, like, it's, so yes, every time you get new people doing these things, um, you get the same, like, the same kinds of comments in. And so it takes a little bit of wisdom to say, no, well, let, let's listen to them because they're the ones who are going to buy or not buy our product. So, yeah. Yes? Yeah, I just, <clears throat> so do you apply your, pro you know, you had a process, a few slides of process. Yeah. Do you apply that process to the development of your process? Do I apply that process to the development of my process? Um, I don't know whether I should be embarrassed to say this, but yes, actually, I do. <laughs> it, it's hard to take the time out to really think about it. Um, uh, and it's moving so fast that it's kind of hard to keep up. But yeah, I, I try very hard to. There's um, an executive coach in San Francisco who has kindly given us some of her time. And you can't. It is hard to facilitate oneself, um, so I have asked her to come and help us out a little bit. So, yes, again, not fun. So, JJ, um, I, I really like bring us home, home, JJ. No, I'm scared. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> I like the concept you talked about about house cleaning, and I, so I'm trying to butcher my thought that I have about that, but because um, it really resonates with me. But how do you deal with um, introducing? new concepts that you know will cause house, like, hey, you know, we, we know we are doing this right, now we have the opportunity to do something new and do it better, but we know that if this works, you're gonna have to go back and, you know what I mean? Yeah, so I think I, I think I can repeat it. So how do you introduce, so, so there's a situation where you know you need to kind of break stuff yeah. to make the next leap. How do you reorganize the drawers when you know it means you have to clean the whole garage? Thank you. Like <laughs> yeah, well, you, I think, if it's the right thing to do, you just do it, right. right? You do it in the lightweight way so that you can get validation that it's the right thing to do because you know that you're, like downstream, you're committing yourself to a lot of other effort, right? right. So like like the new homepage. Like, we had to redesign the rest of the site around that freaking homepage, but it was worth the money. So we did a scale test. I, Mythbusters fans, I love Mythbusters. Yeah. <laughs> so like they're always doing scale experiments. So you do a little scale experiment. At the end of the day, you know, you toss it away or you put it in one of those boxes on the shelf that Jamie has that go up to the ceiling. And you know, and then you do the full on thing. But you, you kind of prove out the concept first before you sign yourself up for a world of hurt. And that's the last question. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>